All right, you're very welcome back. And uh, I've got a book with me in studio this morning. It's called Cold Water Eden by Richie Fitzgerald. Richie, uh, for those unfamiliar, is uh, a surfing legend, a bit of a legend in the Irish surfing community. Uh, just published this book and uh, Ireland's first ever professional surfer. Delighted to say Richie is uh, in studio with me this morning. Richie, good afternoon and good morning. How are you keeping? Thank you very much. I'm keeping really well. Bit of a rainy day in Dublin, but... Well, it suits you. It You're... suits me. I like being wet. Yeah, there's no there's no wetsuit, but um, the, the, the book is, is is incredible. You can see the, the, the subtitle there, One Man's Pursuit of Ireland's Legendary Waves. Like, this is a subject we don't get into probably often enough on, on OTB AM, but... Yeah. Not really. I mean, but surfing is, you know, it's a minority sport in ways, but it's it's mainstream in other ways. You, you know, you drive anywhere along the coast in Ireland, you see surfers or stand up paddleboarders. So it is a it's a vibrant sport and it it grows every year. And uh, fortunately, I've been in surfing for God nearly 40 years now. So right. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I've lived a, a complete life in Irish surfing. And I suppose that was the crux of the book, really. It's funny, like uh, you're a Bandorn man, a Donegal man, and and, and the, the, like the cr- it really comes through the sense of place in the book, like Bandoran and the surfing community up there, and the, I guess the community feel to it really, really adds weight to the book. I think. Yeah, I, I unashamedly love where I'm from. I mean, Bandoran sometimes gets a bad reputation, and rightly so. But it is a it's a beautiful area. We've magnificent surf, and it'd be wrong to say that I'm just really focusing on Bundoran, that kind of Strand Hill, Bundoran, Rosnaila, those three towns are synonymous with surfing and there's a there's a fantastic surf community there. So, you know, we were kind of the second generation, but the first generation of Bundoran surfers growing up there. So it w- really was a wonderful time. It wasn't all fairy tale and dreams. There was, you know, the hard times as well. But um, I wouldn't swap it for anything. Look, it's funny. I'm looking at the, some of the when you think back to maybe the 70s and 80s before all the surfing hype really picked up in Doran, Like now, when you look at the surfing industry in the town, you've got uh, if the stats in front of me are correct, six big surf schools, three surf shops, eight surf hostels, surf yoga centres, surf cafes, pubs, restaurants that cater for for surfing uh, people and clientele as well. So it's really gone from strength to strength. Yeah, it has, Shane. I mean, you, you go to town now, um, you're going to get the same crowd in Bundoran as you've always had, but there's definitely that kind of ocean-minded crowd. You've got your cool dudes on bikes and blonde hair and drinking eco coffee and surfing waves. and So it has. It's changed a lot. And it's a, you know, it's a practical uh, industry as well. It employs a lot of people. There's a lot of hostels, as you say, and surf schools. and So it is relevant in the Northwest, but the whole area as well. So it's it's a... It's a good thing to have in the area, and it's a good positive image of the place as well. But it's legitimate. The waves are fantastic on the northwest coast. So if the waves weren't good, we wouldn't have it. And really, the talking point is the waves at the end of the day. 100%. And, and like, some of the waves are just astounding, and some of the stories in the book are, are remarkable. And, and terrifying is probably a, a, an accurate word. Like, it, is there a point at which, and I know you probably grew up around this, and I know your siblings were probably influencers when it came yes. to getting involved in surfing as well. But at what point do those waves go from terrifying to exciting yeah it's uh, look 99% of people will just do surf lessons in the Hinch Bundoran or Snyder or wherever there is only a tiny less than 1% that will ever pursue waves over 10 feet so you have to have the experience and you have to be that kind of person but really waves over 20 feet get into the terrifying uh, you know that's that's the terrifying level and we went out into waves about 50 feet so you know you just don't go out there half cocked you, we had a lot of experience and you put in the time the training as you would with any professional sport but it is madness calculated madness but it is pure madness and there's nothing logical about standing on the top of a 50 foot wave and you know belting down a really shallow reef it's violent it's powerful it's awe-inspiring it's terrifying it's all those things you'd imagine and there's no real rationale in it and you know self-preservation goes out the window but you just are one of those people or you're not and myself and Gabe Davies were one of those or two of those kind of people but you know if you met us on the street you wouldn't think it but yeah you know that's you know you meet people like that all the time we never really broadcast it too much until now I'm writing the book <laughs> <laughs> do you have to be an adrenaline junkie is is it like a do you know people say goalkeepers everyone is a goalkeeper has a little bit of madness inside them is it, is there something similar in, in involved in surfing do you have to have that little bit of uh, something different i guess to, to get involved in I, surfing? I can't speak for everyone but just for myself there was kind of um not a lot of people were doing it so that was an attraction to me and the waves were there and no one was surfing them above a certain size you know adrenaline junkie gets bandied around a bit but you are right you know you see it on tv and the x games and all that kind of carry on and you wouldn't look at me and think I was an, an adrenaline junkie. But yeah, you do have to have that certain, I would say, personality or that certain drive or that want to go out and put your life in danger to surf gigantic waves. 
and it, I guess it was just in my DNA somehow. I, I love hearing people's origin stories, you know, in, in sport. We hear a lot of sto- uh, stories on this show about how people got involved in, in, in their hobby or sport or profession or whatever it is. Uh, like reading the story of you starting at the age of nine in the book and, you know, using, I think it's melted christening candles that you robbed from the, the family shop to, to wax the surfboards. Like that's... That's a, an incredible way to start, but you have to start somewhere. I mean, we're walking around Dublin today and there's surf shops and there's Patagonia store around the corner, but there was nothing like that in the cities or, you know, especially on the coast when I grew up. So you had to be inventive. Uh, so we used christening candles robbed from mom's shop, marigold gloves over our school gloves, you know, cobbled together bits of wetsuits. I used to wear Dunstore sizzlers and tracksuit bottoms on with a top. And so it was horrendous, but we didn't really realize it then you know that's just the way it was for yeah. us when you look back now you know everything's easy in hindsight but it was it was hardcore and it was definitely very inventive and and uh yeah i couldn't imagine doing it now though i can imagine <laughs> like it's it takes its toll on the body i'd imagine over a certain number of years like it, it was great like reading as well when you when you talked about always being a beach boy from a from a young age and you were talking about uh i'd be there in winter and summer in and out of the water building sandcastles fishing swimming body surfing playing in rock pools yeah. and then your older brothers and sisters obviously as well uh, had a part in that but it, there is something beautiful about that like you're obviously from a, a seaside town anyway but it, that love of the beach and the sea has to be ingrained in you from a young age in order to probably delve into the, the world of surfing anyway. Yeah, I said it to someone yesterday where I grew up, obviously 50% of your hinterland is the ocean, so we're the sea. And if you don't engage with it, whether it's walking on the beach or you know collecting shells or surfing or swimming, that's closed off to you. So we were very much a family that faced the sea. And I just loved everything about it, rummaging around in rock pools and, and swimming and then body surfing and bodyboarding and then surfing. And so we were a family that was engaged in that. And, you know, it, it was either that or you didn't engage with it at all in Bundorn. So, you know, I was lucky where I grew up and the family I grew up in. We were a really good family and parents were encouraging. So I uh, I was very lucky in that respect. Is, is it something like we talk about risk? Um uh, and I guess risk is all is always relative. Like you're obviously a strong swimmer. You're you're used to the currents and and the size of the waves. Is there a, a thing? And you you talk about it in the book as well. And, and your young fam, you have a young family and you have kids and a wife, of course, as well. Like, does that does that life altering moment when you start having kids change your perception of of what you do, or or is, is it kind of just that it clicks you into gear and makes you more more I, I guess aware of safety? I probably you know sound very self serving and a bit dramatic, but yeah, when my daughter Ella was born. 10 years ago, it did change. It clicked something in my in my brain, my DNA or whatever changed. But at the time, I you know I was in my late 30s, then late 40s now, I had achieved a lot. I achieved stuff beyond my ability, really, and beyond my wildest dreams. You know, we'd surfed the biggest waves in Europe. I'd sponsored Surfered and really good in Europeans and traveled and got lots of accolades. And I just thought, you know what? Those are really good innings I've had in surfing in the last 30 years. I'm just going to hang my hat on it now because I had a fantastic year and just the desire wasn't there anymore. I didn't want to. I just had no desire to go out into big pounding waves that would endanger me not being able to be with my daughter Ellen and my son Kai. So it sounds dramatic, but it's it's absolutely true. Mm. Yeah, I just, something switched off in me that day when Ella was born in Sligo General Hospital and it never really has switched on again. There was a great, there's a great section in the book I want to just touch on here that where, where you talk about the, you know, how all-consuming the the surfing world is, and it perfectly kind of encapsulates, I guess how all-consuming it has to be in order to be a, as good as it is. So you say in the on page ninety seven here in the book, um, surfing really started to dominate every aspect of my life, my physical shape, my desire, my mental attitude, and financial thinking. It's a sport that makes you single-minded, verging on the obsessive, which leads you down a road of insatiable greed with your free time. It's a, it's a lovely way of, of describing it and, and talking about how, you know, I guess, verbalising how much uh, an obsession and a hobby like that takes over your life. Yeah, it does. And I've been lucky enough to meet lots of sports people, you know, football and rugby over the years, professional in Ireland and overseas. And, you know, a lot of them have that similar story. But with me, it was surfing didn't come naturally to me. I love to see, but I wasn't naturally good at it. Mm. So I really had to work at it. And I'm, I'm stubborn and I'm driven when I want to be. So I just spent thousands of hours you know 12 hours a day in the water you know until my mom would come down or send one of my siblings down to drag me out and I'd have you know I'd be dehydrated and sick the next day but I think it takes that to excel at a sport if you want to and I I just had a bee in my bonnet about it from a very young age I just wanted to be better I would borrow off other people you know what they were doing and I kind of built a scrapbook of my own surfing but yeah it it, it is you become very single-minded and very selfish with your time mm. and everything else 
you know, obviously having kids later on, that changes. But yeah, for a chunk of my life, it was all about surfing. I probably wasn't the nicest person to hang out with that much. And, you know, surfing came before anything, really. But that's what you have to do if you want to, if you want to, especially in Ireland, like if you wanted to open those doors to the international scene, which are kind of open now, but we were the first, you know, to, to push through that. Um, and that's what it took. And that's what I did. It's funny, I, I, pro- I usually get slagged for, for bringing every conversation back to snooker in some way, shape or form, but <laughs> I think back to a story of um, Stephen Hendry, the great seven-time world champion, yep. talking about the importance of the queue, the snooker queue, and I think one time he was travelling on, f- on a flight and the queue was broken in half through security and uh, he didn't play the same for, for quite some time. Like Looking through the, the photos in the middle of the book and all the different surfboards you've had over the, over the years, just how important is finding that that board that 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 well becomes a almost an extension of yourself really it's absolutely important it took me a long time to work that out because there's a lot of idiosyncrasies in board design and millimeters make a difference in it but yeah I, eventually i found you know some good good board shapers in california and on the hawaiian islands and and within europe and you do have your favorite surfboards i had a, a blue surfboard in the, in the mid 90s that i loved the hawaiian island creations it was a magic surfboard and I eventually broke it. And I was never able to replicate that surfboard again. You just, you cannot get it, but you will. Maybe every 20 surfboards, I'd, I'd find that magic one. But it's become quite systematic now with the computer technology and the way um, it's made by machines more than anything else now, like like the Terminator surfboards. <laughs> but um, you can get replication in surfboards a lot easier now. So, you know, I've kind of found my, my magic boards at the moment, but then I'm not the surfer I once was, so I'm using easier ones. Yeah, Middle-aged yeah. surfboards, shall we say. <laughs> <laughs> I'd say you're still not bad on the board. Yeah. Um, like, I guess one aspect of it as well is it, is it allows you to travel a lifestyle like that. You're obviously all going all over the world. Like, and it strikes me when you're in places like California and Hawaii, um, and even other places around the coast of Ireland. I know Mullock Moor was a place special in, in your heart for pioneering that. That place is a, a surfing mecca. But and you use the word Eden on the front as well. Like, where for you is surfing Mecca and surfing paradise? Well, for it? me, it's the west coast of Ireland when you, and especially focused on the northwest, you, you know, if you're surfing at a certain stage, you don't care about weather or temperature. It's all about the waves. Mm. So as lovely it is, is to surf in Barbados and you know, all these hot places, and I did touch on travel, but I've pretty much traveled it everywhere. I've surfed almost every wave I've ever wanted to surf, but... There's nowhere like home. There's nowhere as good as the west coast of Ireland. In my eyes, if you could just put up with a bit of harsh weather in the winter, we've got magnificent coastline, beautiful beaches, and unbelievably good surf. And it's not just me that says it. It's, you know, people like Kelly Slater who, you know, said Ireland's a cold water paradise. So, you know, I, I can say it, but I'm local. But when you hear other people say it, you think, wow, we really have something special on the west coast. Uh, I mentioned Mullock Moor there, uh, and most Irish people listening will know Mullock Moor. A lot of them would have been to Mullock Moor and seen the size of the waves there. Uh, and you, you talk in the book about how that being, you know, pioneering the big waves there as being one of, if not the most proud things you've done in your career. Uh, t- maybe talk to us about that and, and the work you did with Gabe Davis in Mullock Moor and, and, and g- turning Mullock Moor from a town into a, yeah. a place we all recognise as a Yeah, it was pivotal there. in my life, but, you know, growing up in Mullock Moor, it's a beautiful town and it's in Sligo, not Donegal, so it's across <laughs> the border from us and I must always state that. <laughs> but we knew there was a big wave out there and we'd been looking at it, especially me, for my whole life, but no one was surfing it. And, you know, waves at a certain intensity or a certain size, you cannot physically paddle into them. So when jet ski technology came on board in the late 90s where you're you're like a water skier and you get towed into a wave that's too big to paddle into, which is a crazy kind of thing to think of. So we started tinkering with Mullock Moore and we were really the first out there. It wasn't many, it was only one or two crews in Europe, so we were the first out there. And we just worked it out. It was trial and error, mm. you know, loads of bad days, loads of hammerings, and then eventually you get your good waves and you build it up and you surf it at 10 foot and 20 foot and 25 foot and 30 foot and eventually up to 50 feet. But now it's, you know, it's so well established it's rolls off the tongue of nearly every surfer in the world knows Mullock Moor. But when we used to go out, it was just sheep and seagulls watching us. Now there's thousands of people who go out to watch. But I like that. That's progress. And I'm glad we pioneered it because I'll always have that forever, you know? Yeah, of course. Like you, you, you touch on the book as well about uh, on OCD and you touch on, on burnout. Uh, and burnout's a thing that, that's come up in, in this studio at different times with different sports people who just reach the end of their tether with their with their sport or they just move on to different things. But it, it, But it's a serious 
it's a serious issue, you know, for for all sports people and with sports psychology, as serious as it is now, and rightfully so, it's becoming maybe something that that can be managed. But burnout is is something yeah. that, that impacted you as well. It was burnout and mental health, you know, was I def- definitely suffered from it. It was you know self inflicted. I had a lot of anxiety and you know just striving all the time and pushing, pushing, pushing. I mean now it's well recognised. Luckily I had a good family and you know worked it out eventually. But yeah, I used to burn out. I just wanted everything to to be the maximum be the best I could at everything which you're never going to be so you know I would be a contest and surfing big waves and trying to improve myself as a professional surfer because I was the first one in Ireland to sign a pro deal and especially after the world championships in California where I had a double whammy last I came back and I just didn't want anything to do with surfing for a few months I played indoor football and watched rugby on TV and totally disconnected. And that was refreshing as well. And you just have to surround yourself with good people. I mean, there's a lot more awareness of it now, but certainly, yeah, I, you know, there's times in my life I was a mess, you know, luckily I didn't have that desire to turn to a vice. I just would work it out myself. Um, so I suppose I, n- I never had to go down that road, but absolutely um, you get burnt out, even in something as gloriously passive and beautiful as surfing and you're immersed in, in the wilds and, you know, the ocean, but, you know, you can burn out on almost anything if you, you push it too much, and that's what I did in surfing at certain times. Yeah. I, I Just before we finish, uh, Richie, just wanted to touch on, I suppose, the the increased interest, uh, that's what I gauge anyway, in, in, in surfing in Ireland. Um, and I know the, the infrastructure in the country is important in that regard. Um, I guess surfboard technology, and, and I think you touch on wetsuit technology and that sort of thing, getting people involved. But is that something you've 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 noticed at a tangible increase in, in Irish people especially being interested in surfing? Absolutely. I mean, it's very hard to gauge for me now. It used to be very centred on, on you know, Bundorn and Lahinch and Tremor and Port Rush and all those towns, Strand Hill. Now it's widespread. You'll see surfboards on every road in Ireland and all around the place. But it is, it, that, that kind of space age technology and pricing has gone down in wetsuits and surfboards availability and just knowledge. Irish people are facing the sea a lot more. We used to face away from it a lot. Mm. So, you know, Irish people are engaged with the sea. You can see, especially over COVID, a lot of people got into sea swimming and that all lends itself to engagement with the sea and a lot of people are surfing and that's what I love. But yeah, absolutely, it's, uh, it's getting busier and, you know, people are doing it a lot more every year, so... Hopefully that continues. Long may continue for sure. Where can people get their hands on a copy of the book, Richie? I think Eason's and all good bookstores, uh, Hodges and Figgis. It's been uh, Dubray's. So I think it's in, in all good bookstores nationwide at the moment. Brilliant.